Good morning, West Side. I hope everybody had a great weekend. How's everybody doing this morning? Amen. I tell you what, we're excited to be in the house of the Lord, aren't we? All right, then. Well, we're going to pray, and then we're going to get started into our uh, morning worship. We're uh, glad to see everybody here today, and we're just glad that you're here with us. We're glad those who are joining us online, we say hey to you, too. So we're going to pray and then just jump right into it. Father God, we thank you for this day. A day that you have made your day, Lord, and we thank you that we have the health and the ability to come into your house today. Uh, Lord, we join with uh, other believers worldwide uh, and lifting up your name today. We just ask that you would be honored and glorified in everything that we do today. Father, we're so thankful for just an opportunity to call you our Father. Thank you for loving us despite our faults and our failures. Lord, you are the way. You are the truth and you are the life. We believe that scripture, Lord, and we believe that no man comes to the Father unless they come through you. And may someone today come through you to the Father, Lord. We ask it and we believe it and we pray it in Jesus' name name. Let the church say amen. If you would stand with me as we begin our time this morning. One, two, three, four. Through every battle, through every heartbreak, through every circumstance I believe that you are my fortress Oh, you are my portion You are my hiding place Oh, I believe you are the way The truth
this time of desperation When all we know is doubt and fear There is only one foundation We believe We believe broken generation when all is dark you help us see there is only one salvation we believe we believe we believe in God the Father Jesus Christ, we believe in the Holy Spirit, and He's given us new life. We believe in the crucifixion, we believe that He conquered death. We believe in the resurrection, and He's coming back again. We believe. and temptation we believe we believe we believe in God the Father we believe in Jesus Christ we believe in the Holy Spirit and he's given us new life we believe in the crucifixion we believe that he conquered death. We believe in the resurrection. And he's coming back again. Let the lost be found and the dead be raised. In the here and now, let love invade. Let the church live loud. Our God will save. We believe, we believe. And the gates of hell will not prevail for the power. It's torn the veil, and we know your love will never fail. We believe, we believe, we believe in God the Father. We believe in Jesus Christ. We believe in the Holy Spirit, and He's given us new life. We believe in the crucifixion. We believe that He conquered death. We believe in the resurrection. And He's coming back again. Coming back again. He's coming back again.
not speak, you made no sound. You died for your accusers. And as your blood fell to the ground, you redefined my future. For every 
every sin on him was laid. Here in the death of Christ I live. There in the ground his body laid. Light of the world by darkness slain. Then bursting forth in glorious day. From the grave he rose again, and as he stands in victory, since curse has lost its grip on me, for I am his and he is mine, bought with the precious blood of Christ. No guilt in life. No fear in death, this is the power of Christ in me. From life's first cry to final breath, Jesus commands my destiny. No power of hell, no scheme of man can ever block me from his hand. Till he returns or calls me home, here in the power of Christ I'll stand. Till he returns or calls me home, here in the power of Christ I'll stand. Please be seated. Let's pray. Lord God in heaven, Father, we are uh, we're here to worship you, Lord. Uh, Father, and we come to this place, Lord, may our hearts desire, uh, though distracted as we may be for a multitude of reasons, Lord, draw our fo draw our focus, draw our worship to you. Well, Jesus, we just give you praise for all that you're doing in our lives, Lord, that we see and that we don't see, Lord, that we miss. Lord, sometimes we may be even ungrateful for or just uh, remiss in giving you thanks, Lord. But Father, today, help us to be thankful in our hearts that we can be here, we can join together in a fellowship of believers, Lord, and worship you. That we can sing songs to you, about you, for you. That we can pray together. That we can uh, just be together, Lord. And Lord, we'll look forward to hearing a, a message from, from our pastor, John, Lord, that you've prepared in his heart to bring to us this morning, Lord God. Pray that it would touch each and, our, each and every one of our hearts and lives today. May each person receive what they need this morning, Lord God, from you, Lord. May your spirit reign and move in our lives every day, Lord God. May we give you uh, every day, Lord. May we not just give you a, a small percentage of our day, Lord. May we focus on you daily, Lord. Help me to do that personally, Lord. Lord, we just ask that today, if there might be one watching online or within the walls of this church that has never... Uh, come to faith in you, Jesus, and not uh, trusted you as Lord and Savior. Today might be the day of their salvation, Lord God. That would be our prayer today, Lord, and just meet every other need that's here, Lord, that's maybe a, a family situation, a family struggle, relationship struggle, Lord, job struggle, financial struggle, whatever it is, Lord God, that maybe it's a health issue, Lord, that you be with each and every one, Lord, because you know all about us, Lord. We give you praise and glory for this day and for this time, for every day, Lord. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you, Bobby. Thank you, praise team. Y'all can uh, have a seat. And, uh, you know, I was sitting there playing. I'm like, man, there just seems like there's a struggle here this morning. And I don't know if we're just overwhelmed, church, with what's going on in our lives. But I just want to remind you this morning. The devil can only do so much to you. He can't take your salvation away. He can't, he can't take that from you at all. He can't take God's presence in your life. I know we go through stuff, but church, man, 
hold on to those promises the Lord has for you and I. Um, and, and I just want to encourage you to, if you feel like there's a struggle going on with, with you this morning or with me, you know, I want to encourage you to take some time to spend with God. Take, take some time to worship. Maybe, maybe you don't like the worship song. Man, I wish we'd do the old hymns or I wish, you know, I understand that. But I want to take, pull out the CDs, whatever you have. Spend some time worshiping the Lord and, and just drawing close to Him through worship or spending time in in God's word, uh, because that's where you'll draw your strength from. That's that's where you'll get that. So I don't know. I, I just as we're playing this morning, I'm like, man, it just seems like there's a. I don't have like a spidey sense or anything, nothing like that from a pastor's point of view. But it just seemed like there was a little bit of a struggle this morning. I just want to encourage you. Uh, go back to that time you spend with the Lord, uh, wh wherever that is, whatever your routine is. So. All right, well, good morning. Welcome. We're glad you're here this morning. Glad if you're watching online or you're here in person. Uh, we'll go over announcements at the end of the service, but just want to just mention briefly, if you're visiting with us, you're a guest today, this is our bulletin. The most important thing in there is not the announcements. It's not the sermon outline on the back. It's the little tear-off section there on the bulletin. If you're visiting with us, we just ask that you would fill that out and drop in the offering plate at the end of the service. That's just a way to keep your record of attendance here. Uh, we don't ask for anything else, but just drop that in there. Uh, if you're a, a member and maybe you've changed your contact information, you've got a new email, a new cell phone, you moved, whatever, you can use that form also to just change your uh, information there. But the most important thing is on the back of that, and that's the place for prayer requests. Uh, please take take some time uh, this morning and write any kind of prayer requests you have on there. Uh, if you mark it confidential or private, uh, that just goes to me and I'll pray for that but otherwise we'll the staff will pray through that this week and I pray for it and then we'll put it in the prayer sheet on Wednesdays and we just keep that uh, bathed in prayer uh, from a church standpoint so that's just your way to, to communicate with us so all right well I'm excited about this morning's message I just feel like it's going to be something good it's going to challenge us but uh, but before we get into that uh, let's just take a few minutes to stand up and greet one another give a hug somebody we need some I think do we, do we need hugs this morning give give good hugs so we can always hugs are always good but a hug handshake uh, slap somebody on the back of the head if, if they need it you know sometimes we need it sometimes I need it so but let's let's stand up and uh, reach across the aisles and greet one another and then we'll come back for our message
can find your way back to your seat, and if you can't find your seat, just sit in somebody else's seat. That'll be all right. No, that's all right. No, do that. I make a mess. All right, good morning. Um, just, uh, just to remind you, at the end of the service uh, this morning, we will have the specially called business meeting uh, for the two purposes to, uh, to call uh, Devin Freeman as our student pastor and also to, amen, yeah, amen to that, and also to uh, elect the new church council members and Bible study teachers for the next year. Um, I, I do want to tell you real quick, um, uh, Monday I, I went out with, I keep taking my glasses on and off. Anyway, I went out with Devin and his wife Monday. We were looking at some areas here, the possible home areas and just different areas. And I got to enjoy riding around with them, getting them, uh, getting to know them a little bit better. And I tell you one thing that really impressed me about Devin, and this is something that, you know, we, you can interview. We, we sat down, Bobby and, and several others sat down with them and, and interviewed with over a screen. But uh, on Monday, I, I, I really learned two things about Devin. Number one, he loves coffee. <laughs> and, and, you know, everybody's got their thing, right? And he was talking about just how he met his wife in a coffee shop. And that's just a special place that he enjoys going. It's the atmosphere and all that. And he was talking about, like, all the, the different kinds of coffee. And I was kind of like, uh, what? Okay, yeah, okay. <laughs> you know, just like, okay, I, you love coffee. But, but the second thing I picked up, church, is that he loves Jesus. And he loves his relationship with Christ. He, um, we, before they hit back to their house and their home in North Carolina, we stopped at Boulder Creek Coffee in downtown Lawrenceville and uh, just said, hey, it's a neat place. You want to check it out? You like coffee? So we're there and um, we're talking in the shop there and Devin's telling me about how he met his wife there. Well, the guy behind the counter at Boulder Creek was kind of like listening to our conversation and he, he kind of piped in. His name is Isaac. And pray, pray for Isaac, by the way. So, But he said, well, hey, how did you know when when it was the right time to ask your wife to marry you. And Devin just began to like continue on that conversation and he, he brought in his faith in that conversation and, and it was like 10 minutes later and we're still talking to Isaac <laughs> about Christ and we come to find out Isaac's a believer. He, he came to trust Christ but he, he just needs a, a community to be plugged into and he needs just some encouragement and, and I just watched Devin just share his faith and his, you know, encourage Isaac right there in the coffee shop. And I, I tell you, I, I told Bobby, I said, I saw more there about who Devin is than almost uh, you know, an hour long interview. So I, I'm just really encouraged um, that, that Devin, I believe, is, is the right person uh, for the job here as a student pastor. But we'll, we'll take that vote and affirm that at the end of the service uh, this morning. But I, I just want you to be encouraged. I want you to kind of get a, a picture of what I saw uh, last week when we were going out uh, looking around the area. Um, okay, well, this, this morning we're going to be in Acts chapter 8, verse 26. We're talking about ride share evangelism. What, what's that all about? Um, we'll get to that in just a minute. This, this sermon this week really picks off, picks up, rather, uh, right where we left off last week. Um, we were last week, if you remember, we talked about how persecution caused the gospel to, to be spread because people were running, but they were continuing to share the gospel. And then we, we also looked at how some people tried to pervert the gospel and the Christian faith to, to use it for their own personal benefit. Um, today, we're going to kind of zone in back on Philip. We, we started talking about Philip last Sunday, but we're going to go back to Philip again this morning um, and see a little bit of how the Holy Spirit uh, connected, if you will, or shared with Philip in this encounter that Philip had this morning. We're going to look at with the uh, uh, Ethiopian eunuch, okay? Uh, we're going to see uh, what I, I call a ride share evangelism. You know, just, you, you know, if you've heard the story before, you know, Philip, he runs up beside this chariot and the, the Ethiopian eunuch says, hey, come on and, you know, tell me about the scripture. We'll, we'll get to that in just a minute. But so 
with our sharing ride, but I really, there's a pun here, there's a play on words here with the ride share evangelism. I, I tried to throw in some kind of Uber or Lyft thing, I just, I wasn't creative enough. But really, church, I hope you'll see, this is like the main point that we'll all need to see this morning. There, there's a sharing, if you will, of the responsibility, there's a partnership with you and I and the Holy Spirit when it comes to evangelism, all right? The Holy Spirit does his part. He leads us. And then we have our part where we, hopefully, we're obedient to where the Holy Spirit is calling us to go. And when those two mash up, when, when we listen to the Holy Spirit, when he leads us, and when we obey good results will come out of that, okay? And so that's, that's, that's the main uh, sermon in, in a sentence, if you will, this morning. Uh, two, two, only two points this morning. Well, you guys are getting it off easy, so, but don't worry, they're twice as long as my three-point sermons. So that's okay. So anyway, ha! Anyway, so let's, let's get into the passage this morning. Uh, let's read, if you will, and if, if you're able to, if you can stand in honor of God's Word uh, while we read God's Word here, I'm going to start in... Acts chapter 8, starting in verse 26. Now an angel of the Lord said to Philip, Go south to the road, the desert road that goes down from Jerusalem to Gaza. So he started out, and on his way he met an Ethiopian eunuch, an important official in charge of all the treasury of Candace, queen of the Ethiopians. This man had gone to Jerusalem to worship, and on his way home he was sitting in his chariot, reading the book of Isaiah, the prophet. The spirit told Philip, Go to that chariot and stay Stay near it. Then Philip ran up to the chariot and heard the man reading Isaiah the prophet. Do you understand what you're reading? Philip asked. How can I, he asked, unless someone explains it to me. So he invited Philip to come up and sit with him. The eunuch was reading this passage of scripture. He was led like a sheep to the slaughter as a lamb before the shears is silent. So he did not open his mouth. In humiliation, he was deprived of justice. Who can speak of his descendants? For his life was taken from the earth. The eunuch asked Philip, Tell me, please, who is the prophet talking about, himself or someone else? Then Philip began with that very passage of Scripture and told him the good news about Jesus. As he traveled along the road, they came to some water, and the eunuch said, Look, here is water. Why shouldn't I be baptized? And he gave orders to stop the chariot. Then both Philip and the eunuch went down into the water, and Philip baptized him. When they came up out of the water, the Spirit of the Lord suddenly took Philip away, and the eunuch did not see him again, but went on his way rejoicing. Uh, Philip, however, appeared at Azotus and traveled about preaching the gospel in all the towns until he reached Caesarea. All right, you can have a seat. Thank you. Appreciate that. Uh, two things I just want to uh, share with you this morning, and, and it's both sides of the coin here as, as far as this uh, ride share evangelism goes. Uh, the first one deals with the Holy Spirit. Uh, so on your outline on the back of the uh, bulletin there, uh, point number one is, is God can lead us in a direction to an unknown task ahead. God can lead us in a direction to an unknown task ahead. Now, keep in mind, re remember, church, where Philip was before this. Uh, God had just used Philip in an awesome, mighty way in Samaria, right? If you go back just to the, the previous verses here, right there at the beginning of chapter uh, 8, verse 4, it says, Those who have been scattered preached the word wherever they went. Philip went down to a city in Samaria and proclaimed Christ there. If you remember what happened... God used Philip, and there, there was great joy, and everything was brought, and, and things were going well. It got so uh, awesome, in fact, that Peter and John came up, some of the disciples came up from Jerusalem to see, like, what was going on, because they heard everything that was going on there. Um, Verse 25 of chapter 8 says, Peter and John returned to Jerusalem preaching the gospel in many Samaritan vi uh, villages. So, like, the gospel's being spread right there in Samaria. 
Now, here's what you, you have to, I, didn't, I should, have, should have put a map on the, on the screens behind me, but I didn't. Uh, Samaria, all right, Jerusalem is right there, kind of in the south central part of, of Israel, what you might think. Samaria is to the north, right? That's where the Samaritans settled after the kingdom split, and many of them returned. They intermarried with some of the Gentiles, and that's when they, they got that, uh, remember that, I guess, uh, name of Samarians because they were half Jews and half Gentiles. And remember how the Jews felt about the Samaritans, right? And we know what Jesus did to reach many of the Samaritans, the woman at the well, and so many of you know others. But so Samaria is to the north. So here we get instructions according to verse 26 says, Now an angel of the Lord said to Philip, Go south on the road. That desert road. Well, okay, so here, church, Philip is asked to like do a 180. All right, you've been up here in the north. God's doing some awesome stuff in Samaria. People are hearing the gospel. Now I want you to go south. <laughs> and I want you to go down that desert road. What? Okay, and it's on the way to like Egypt and Ethiopia there, uh, on the way to Gaza, the scripture says. Uh, don't don't miss like some information here. <laughs> all right, I think we need to like sit on this and, and think about it for a minute. This goes against our human nature <laughs> as people to want to do something like Philip did. Okay, um, for for two reasons. Number one. We, we naturally, I think most people, unless you're crazy <laughs> like that, and you just, you like change, but most people don't like change in their life, right? We like things to be the same. We like routine. Now, some people are wired differently. They, they like to mix things up. Some of you weird people like to rearrange the furniture in your house, like every two months. I know, anybody confess? No, okay, no, some, <laughs> uh, anyway. But some people, you know, but most people don't. Most people, we, we like things to remain the same. And think about what was going on here. God was using Philip and there was a lot like going on in Samaria and, and things were good. And that's the second thing that I think goes against our human nature. When things are going good in our life, we want them to keep going good, right? And we're like, yeah, all right, God, yeah, man, you're working over here. You're doing this in my life or my family's life or my church life. Keep it up, God. Yeah, 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 yeah. We don't like it when things go bad and go get kind of tough or when circumstances might cause us to, to get squeezed a little bit or, or we get under pressure or stress. And, and so think about what was happening here. Philip was asked to leave everything that was going good in Samaria and the gospel was being spread and talked about. And now this angel of the Lord comes up to, you know, and, and says to Philip, hey, now I want you to go south. I want you to leave everything that's going good here in Samaria and I want you to go a different direction. And, and I want you to go down this road. And guess what? It's not just any road. It's, it's a desert road. It's dry. It, there's not a lot of resources there. It's, you, you might have to make sure you take enough resources with you or whatever, you know. And I think that goes against our human nature, really. But the Spirit said, I want you to go south. And that's what Philip did. And, and so... And we see that in verse 29, uh, the Spirit says, you know, he, he tells him also, hey, now, now that you're going south, now that you're there, go, go walk up next to that, go run up next to that chariot that you see down there. So again, the Holy Spirit gives directions, right? First, the, the angel of the Lord says, go south, go to the desert road on the way to Gaza. He doesn't give him much details, right? But then next, after he obeys, then God, through the Holy Spirit, according to verse 29, says, now I want you to go up next to that chariot you see. Kind of jog next to it. I don't know, I don't know how fast chariots could, could go back then. Was it like 15, 20 miles an hour? Who knows? Um, probably as fast as the horse would go, right? But uh, so next, the Spirit's telling him to do that. You know, did you notice? It's like a one step at a time thing, all right? 
Go, all right, go south. I want you to go that road. Now, now, Philip, now you're on that road. Now I want you to go run up next to that chariot. Um, I, it made me think of, like, you know, <laughs> again, against human nature, right? As people, especially nowadays in our culture, we, we want to know everything in advance, don't we? We want to we wanna have all the, de okay, God, I'll do that. But first, you got to explain all the details to me. <laughs> all right, you're going to tell me where I'm going to go, what my itinerary is. You know, Emmanuel is, is on his mission trip. You know, we prayed for him last Sunday. And he, he'll be over there for a number of weeks. He may have some itinerary of things where he's going, but there may be some things that God is calling Emmanuel to do that, that you know, he hadn't planned on his radar, if you will. And, and that just seems to, to go against that human nature. It, it kind of reminded me in the Old Testament of Abraham, right? You remember when God told Abraham in Genesis 12 and 15, Abraham, Abram at that point, right? Go, leave your people, leave your land, leave your family, and go to where I'm going to tell you to go. And he, and he didn't actually give him the specific details. He just said, I want you to go. And Abram got up and he went. And God kind of told him, all right, camp here. All right, wake up tomorrow now. I want you to go here. You know, it was like a one step at a time type deal, if you will, right? Um, it reminds me of, of Proverbs 19, uh, 9. Uh, you, many of you know this. It says, the heart of a man plans his way, but the Lord establishes his steps. The heart of a man plans his way, but the Lord establishes his steps. Um, same thing happened with Philip here. God told Philip through an angel of the Lord and through the Holy Spirit, go south, go, go here. Next, next step, you know, just kind of one thing at a time. Wow, that, that is hard. You know, <laughs> is, is there anything, church, for, for you and I, that, that we might can identify with that. You know, we've ever felt God saying, I want you to do this, but I'm not going to tell you why, or I'm not going to give you all the details yet, but I know this is where you're supposed to be, and this is what you're supposed to do. I, I remember feeling that way about seminary, when, when God in 2012 uh, made it clear that I was supposed to go to seminary. And, and I'm like, okay, for what, God? <laughs> I don't know. You know, I, I was loving being a student pastor, didn't want to do anything different. I was loving the job where God had called me, but... But it was clear that God said, you're, you're to go to school and you're to get an education. And I see now why he called me to do that because of the position that I'm at today. But at the time, had no clue. And in fact, if I'm real honest with you, uh, out of the three and a half, four years that I I'd spent in seminary, because I did it part time, God really didn't make that clear really until the last year of my seminary of, of what he wanted me to do. I just knew I was supposed to go. And so many, many, many of you and I feel the same way, right? We, we, we say, okay, God, you want me to do what? But do we struggle? Do we say, I want all the answers first, God. Before, before I take the first step, I want to know all the details. And that's, that's in our human nature. Or church, will, will we just be obedient? Will we say, okay, God, I, I know this is what you're calling me to do, and I just need to be obedient to you. Um, I thought about Devin. You know, he, he uh, even, even before we interviewed him for the first time, I, I took a phone call with, with him because he was just asking some questions about our church and about the area before we interviewed him officially the first time. And he told me this. He says, my wife and I feel called to come to the Atlanta area. I thought, that's interesting, <laughs> you know. And, and so he saw this job opportunity at, at little old Westside Baptist Church, right? And, and he is interested in a part-time position to move here for a part-time position, part-time pay. He's willing to look for another job, you know, and, and, and but he's doing that because he feels that calling of the Holy Spirit on his family's life. And I thought, wow, that, that's pretty relevant. 
So here, here comes the natural next step. Okay, God, I know I should obey the Lord. I know I should listen to the Holy Spirit. But maybe you're here this morning and you're like, well, how do I discern when the Holy Spirit is speaking to me or not? How do I know if it's the Holy Spirit or if it's just Pastor John talking to himself or it might be even the devil trying to trick me into doing something I shouldn't? How, how can I know when the Holy Spirit speaks? Let me, let me give you five quick practical things that you can go through. They'll be on the screen there. You can write these down if you want to, but number one, and this is pretty basic, pretty simple. Does whatever the voice is saying, does it contradict with God's word, all right? If you, you think you're hearing the Holy Spirit tell you to do something and it contradicts with what the Holy Spirit has already said and spoke in Scripture, guess what? That's probably not the Holy Spirit talking to you, okay? All right, you know, the Holy Spirit told me I'm supposed to go down and slap somebody and punch somebody in the face. Well, that, that's probably not what the Holy Spirit's telling you to do. That might be your flesh, right? All right, so, but because the Holy Spirit, according to uh, Second Peter, right? The Holy Spirit inspired these biblical authors to write what they wrote. The Holy Spirit's not going to say, tell you something that's contradictory to what he's already said in Scripture. Okay, that's, that's the first thing. So if you have something, that's the first place we ought to check with. Say, okay, is there anything unbiblical about what I feel like the Holy Spirit's leading me to do? That's step number one. Number two, does the decision or the voice you're hearing, does it bring peace or unrest in your life? Um, what do I mean by that? Okay, if, if you feel like the Holy Spirit is leading you in a direction and you maybe take some steps of action and you start, okay, I feel like this is where I need to go. Let me tell you, the, the spirit who lives inside you as a child of God will do one of two things. He'll, he'll confirm that in you through maybe a sense of peace, like, man, this, this is what I, you know, I need to be doing. Or there might be an unrest in you that comes up through the, your, the spirit because it is contrary to what you know, the Spirit really wants for you to do. And, and so sometimes we have to take a few steps. And, and if we're not sure, we've prayed about it and we'll go through some of these other things. Sometimes we have to actually step out and, and we start and, and we will get that confirmation, if you will, because the Holy Spirit, now here, listen, what's, I'm not saying this too. Sometimes when we follow what the Lord wants us to do, it's oftentimes, church, it's not the easiest decision. Often it's probably the harder decision. The right thing to do sometimes is, is always the harder decision. So I'm not, I'm not talking about, oh man, my life's going to be hard now because I made this, so that must not be... I'm not saying that. <laughs> uh, it doesn't mean the decisions we make, it, only the easy ones are the holy. I'm not saying that, but I'm talking about that inward sense of peace that comes. When, when you and I step out in faith and we start following what we believe is the Lord's direction in our life, do we, do we have that peace that comes from the Holy Spirit? Even though it might be hard, it might be difficult, do we have peace or not? Do we have unrest? All right, go to the next one there, brother. Number three, is there confirmation from other Christians? Maybe you're praying about something and, and you bring it up in your Bible study glass, your class, glass, <laughs> your Bible study class, and you say, hey, hey, I'm praying about this. Would you guys pray along beside me? Would you pray with me about this? And, and you come back and maybe a week or two later and you're talking about it and you're still not sure, but somebody else may say, hey, I was praying for you this week and I just don't know. And so maybe you're, you're asking other people to come in and to help you out praying about that issue. Now, here's the thing, right? If, if you're really praying and you're seeking that and somebody else is doing that or multiple people, and that you get back together and you get a bunch of mixed responses, 
something's not right, right? I mean, the Holy Spirit's not going to tell Beth yes and, and tell Amy no, all right? So more prayer is involved with that, more decision and thinking through that. And so there's, a, there's another way that you can involve other people and say, hey, would you pray with me about this? And, and also with that, you might get some godly advice of maybe a mature believer that you have not thought about, something maybe in the scripture that they've seen that you haven't seen. And so there, when there's a good, uh, it's always a good thing to bring other people in on that. And we, we sometimes we get, I don't know, I don't want everybody knowing about my personal business. We, we love each other. We're family, okay? We got to be willing to say, you know what? This, this is important. Would you pray for me? And, and, and I'll pray for you. So that's, that's something we need to do. All right, number four, does it bring glory to God or does it bring dishonor? Um, I, I had a, a, when I was in student ministry in Columbus, I had a, a volunteer student, uh, an adult working with our students. He, he claimed, and I won't get into specifics, he claimed that God told him to do something uh, while he was working in student ministry, but it, it brought dishonor to God. And, and I had a sit-down conversation with this young man. I said, I, I appreciate you trying to listen to hear the Holy Spirit, but, but the decision that you did, it, it brought some dishonor. It brought some shame or even some reproach against the church and, and against who God is, his very nature. And when God tells you and I to do something, it's not going to negatively affect, the, you know, on the Lord, all right? Because then that's probably not a sign that it's from the Lord. Um, and then lastly, number five there, <laughs> did, did it come true? If you feel like God is telling you to do something specific or have a conversation with somebody, and then this would be the results, um, did, did it come true, you know? Or not. Uh, sometimes we we like to try to hear from the Lord, and sometimes we we want certain things to happen. You know, man, I'd love you know for this to happen, and those might be good things. But sometimes we have to discern: was that really the Lord, or was that just us being hopeful Christians? Um, you know, the, in Deuteronomy, the you remember the the test for the prophet, whether or not the prophet really was speaking for the Lord was this. Number one, did he claim to speak in the name of Yahweh, of God? And number two, did it, did it come true? <laughs> and, and Moses says there in Deuteronomy 19, he says, if it didn't come true, pay no attention. Don't give him that prophet. He's a false prophet because it's not of God if it didn't come true. So after you and I maybe step out on faith and we believe we're listening to the Lord, yeah, man, God told me to do this, and this was going to happen. Okay, well, if you did it, did that take place? Did that happen? Because maybe it wasn't from the Lord if, if it didn't come true, right? That's true prophecy there. Um, not knowing that anybody in here might be a prophet or have the spiritual gift of prophecy, right? But um, those are some good things that you and I can use to judge whether or not you know, are we truly hearing from the Lord, or is it maybe just our own self, or is the devil trying to tempt us into doing something that's unbiblical? So you can use those um, as a guide, if you will. All right. Secondly, uh, on your outline there, uh, the Holy Spirit's done his part, but, but number two, uh, we must obey and do our part to connect uh, people to Jesus Christ through the scriptures. All right? We must obey and do our part to connect people to Jesus through the scriptures. Um, the Spirit, church, always does his part. <laughs> the, the question is, will, will you and I, will we be obedient? Will we follow the Spirit's leading in our lives? Um, verse 27, Philip, Philip was obedient. He, it says right, right there, verse 27, it says, so he started out. And let me tell you, church, that often is the hardest part of obedience, right there, is starting out. <laughs> Man, because there's all sorts of, when, when we feel like the Spirit is speaking to us to do something, to say something, whatever it might be, 
often that is the hardest part is, is getting started. It's taking those first initial steps, right? Once, once we get the snowball rolling, it's, it's easy to say, okay, all right, Lord's doing this. Okay, I'm going to keep going, right? But, but starting out in obedience is often the hardest part of it. And, and that's where we see Philip. He, he started out. He did it. Um, we, we sometimes, we don't like the unknown. We don't like not knowing all the answers. Uh, it makes us freeze and, and like, I don't know. I, I, want, I want some confirmation first and then I'll, then I'll take the next step. But uh, that's where we have to learn that it, obedience it, it is obedience from the very first step. Yeah, it's easy to be obedient uh, a mile down the journey or half a mile down the journey uh, but will we be obedient church in those first couple of steps that, that's the thing that we need to look at so alright the story goes here you know there's Philip is told to go south he goes south and God says alright now go stand next to that chariot and, and kind of walk along or run along jog along next to it and then this is where we see Philip's part taking place look at verse 30 uh, Philip says to him he says do you understand what you're reading Philip asks so apparently he was close enough that where this Ethiopian eunuch had the scroll scroll of Isaiah out and I guess he's reading out loud or maybe someone's reading it to him. Uh, he's reading it out loud so, uh, or Philip takes a peek over in there, oh he's reading Isaiah you know, uh, whatever. So he, he hears what, or maybe it's the Holy Spirit just uh, gave him a clue too. But it says that, that uh, do you understand what you're reading? So he asked the question, he got the conversation started and, and then the, the Ethiopian is like, well, how can I unless somebody helps me? So he invites him up. And then verse, look at verse 35. It says, then Philip began with that very passage of scripture and told him the good news about Jesus. Um, and the passage that the, the Ethiopian eunuch was reading was uh, Isaiah 53. That's a very popular uh, prophecy about Christ. It was probably written 700 to 750 years before Jesus was even born on earth. Um, and when you read that, it's, it's interesting. I've seen people do this on the street. They'll go out and they'll take and they'll read Isaiah 53 and say, hey, who's that talking about to like total strangers? Most people are like, oh yeah, that's talking about Jesus. And they'll say, well, did you know that was written 750 years before Jesus was even born? And people are like, really? Because it sounds like if they have a, a basic or nominal knowledge about who Christ was, they, they can pretty much pinpoint that. that well, that's, that's definitely talking about Jesus. Um, but Isaiah 53 was used multiple times in the New Testament. It was, it was quoted seven times by the apostles and, and other writers in the New Testament. It was a very popular passage because it is so you know, full and rich talking about who Jesus was. So I want to encourage you, be if you're not familiar with Isaiah 53, 53, get familiar with it. it. It is a passage that you and I can use to share the gospel with, and, and we'll get to that in, more in just a minute. But uh, Jesus even quoted it about himself in Luke 22. So there you go. All right, if you need any other proof or evidence that it's about Jesus, just go to Jesus there in Luke, in Luke 22, 35. Um, but verse 36 shows us, by the way, too, the proper way of, of baptism. Not that we're going to fight over baptism. <laughs> you know, like that. Many, many people look, well, you should sprinkle. Some, some denominations take water and they sprinkle over your head. Well, here you see in Acts chapter 8 that, that they went down into the water and, and came up out of the water. And that was the, the method of baptism they used. You know, it doesn't mean we have to do everything like like they did in the in the biblical times. Sometimes we're not able to do that, but you know, when we can, we ought to try to be more biblical, more Christ-like, obviously. But so you see that here in the in the passage. But think about it. All right, because of Philip's obedience to to go south on this desert road and to run up next to this chariot who man it could have been somebody you think about that you know, back then the chariot was like the the method of transportation it was like the most up to date thing it was the way you could get fast somewhere 
only important people had access to these chariots, right? Philip, he could have been scared. Like, I don't want to go up next to that chariot. Somebody might take out a sword and chop my arm off or something, you know? He could have been freaked out and scared. But he was obedient, and he did what the Spirit led him to do. Um, because he did that, this Ethiopian eunuch was the one that took the gospel. And we, and we know through church history that the gospel was spread through Africa through, through events just like this, through Philip and, and other disciples who went and, and shared the gospel. Uh, there's some things in this passage that, that are not stated, but I think we need to see and understand. Phil uh, was learned enough to help the Ethiopian eunuch understand what the scriptures meant. Uh, he was smart enough, he hung out, he knew the disciples enough to be able to take the scriptures that he knew and connect them with Jesus. Um, he, he had spent some time studying God's word, obviously, right? Um, where, where, where are we at, church? Do, do you and I, do we know enough Scripture? Do we know, do we know enough about who Jesus is in Scripture that, that you and I could help connect people with the scriptures to Jesus. Is, is that something in our wheelhouse that, that we feel comfortable doing? Or, you know, have we had, maybe you've gone through some formal training. Maybe you've, you've gone through a, a course where you've learned to share the gospel and, and you've, you understand that. But maybe some of us have not. And maybe we're just kind of uh, like my method of, of typing on the typewriter when I was in high school was the hunt and peck technique, right? It was like, dun, 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 you know, and there's really no uh, training with it. Do we understand enough in the scriptures, church, to be able to point people and connect them with Jesus? With people, that's that's the question this morning. Um, now, here the the Philip, the Ethiopian eunuch, according to the scripture, he was either a proselyte Jew or a God fearing Jew. He was Ethiopian, but you know, if you read the scripture, it says he had just gone to Jerusalem to worship God at the temple, so he had converted to following Yahweh. He was a, a, a proselyte Jew, was somebody who went uh, and believed in, in Yahweh God. Uh, they observed all the practices and they, they also observed circumcision and all the other uh, the rites as Jews. Uh, a God fear was somebody who did that but uh, didn't go all the way with circumcision. All right? So those are the two titles or whatever they had. So Philip, he had like a basis where to start. He knew this guy believed in, in Yahweh, the Old Testament God. And so he just had to simply connect him with Jesus, who Jesus was here in the New Testament. For, for you and I, church, it might be totally different. We, we might run across people who have no knowledge of Christianity or the Old Testament. We might, we might have a conversation with someone who, who says they're an atheist. I had a conversation with a student at Georgia Gwinnett College on a Thursday this week. Uh, we were out there passing out information about the uh, Bible studies that we have on campus there and uh, walked up to a student and he, as soon as we saw what we were about, he's like, oh, no, man. And he kind of like turned to walk away. And, it's like, and I said, wait, 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 wait. Are you, I said, are you atheist? agnostic, you know, a different faith. And so he kind of pulled him back in and we started having a conversation about where his beliefs were. And, and he, he called himself, I guess, like a hopeful agnostic, right? So then I started trying to have a conversation with him about, you know, well, how, how do I know that God exists? And, and so we kind of started there. So wherever, whoever you're talking to really determines where you need to start. Maybe they already believe in God and they say, well, which God? Is it, is it the Muslim God? Is it the Jewish God? Is it the Christian God? The triune God? And, and so we have to determine that. Philip had a place to start, and he could do that. And for you and I, it's a little different. We, we have people from all over, you know, different beliefs, and we have to determine... You know, where we're at. You know, Paul did this, right, with, with Mars Hill. If you remember when he went to the Areopagus, they're in Acts 17. 
uh, he he treated the philosopher is totally different than he did when he talked to the Jews. Paul went back to a different place. You and I have to have the ability to do that too. We, we have to know, who am I talking to? Is this someone who believes in God? Is this someone who, who doubts or questions God's existence? And we have to go from there. Or is this someone who maybe comes from a Hindu background? And I have to you know, teach from that perspective. So we, we've got to figure all that out. But my main point here, as we come to a close this morning, is, is what is our plan, church? I, I hope that you have some kind of a plan that, that you would use to share the gospel with somebody. And now, there's all sorts of programs out there. I started jotting down, there, there's, maybe you're familiar with the Roman Road, CWT, EE, No Sweat Evangelism, Faith, Three Circles, uh, the one we use here at the church, the gospel, the, the six points there. You know, there's all sorts of different ways that you and I can share the gospel. Here you see the picture behind me uh, there. It's, it's this, you can, this is a great, you can take a piece of paper or a napkin at a coffee shop and you can use a, just one verse like Romans 6.23 to, to draw out the gospel. You know, you can you put the, the, the two sides there with a chasm in there and you can draw in the cross that Jesus did. And there's all sorts of things. Uh, several years ago, I learned something, you know, because we always sometimes don't have our Bible with us. We, we have to learn to memorize God's Word, right? We have to hide it in our hearts so that we can use it. Uh, there's, there's one method uh, using the hand, okay? You can, you can share the gospel using the five fingers on your hand. You can start out with the thumb. Hey, have you heard any good news today? You know, have you, let me tell you the best news ever, right? You know, you th people think that, and you can kind of walk through the the things with people. Well, the good news is God loves you. But guess what? The next finger talks about, you know, we call this the pointer finger, right? Sometimes we point and we, we, we talk about somebody did something wrong and you always heard the statement, remember we've got three fingers pointing back to ourselves. Guess what? We've, according to the Bible, we're all sinners. We all have fallen short of God's glory. And so you can walk through that. And then your middle finger, oh, be careful here. All right? but, but you have to hold up three fingers there all right, and say, you know what? But God knew that we were all sinners. So guess what? God provided a cross. And, and the Bible says that Jesus died on a hill between two thieves. And he died for our sins. And then you can go to the next finger, the ring finger, right? All right. A lot of times, if, if you're married, you have a, a, a wedding ring on. You might have a, a ring on there. But that wedding ring symbolizes a commitment. And, and God wants us and desires for us to have a relationship with him. But we have to be willing to make a commitment to God. And you can walk through what it, what it means to make a commitment to God, to, to repent, to place our faith in God, and to trust him as Lord. And then the pinky, right? The little, the little pinky, guess what? It's just a little step that you and I have to make to, to come to God. Because God's done all the work. He died on the cross for us. And he, he desires for us to trust him. And, and are you willing to take that little step of faith right now? And to come up, so you can use your hand. You know, all these things. You, you can, you can, my doofy pastor this week showed me this thing with my hand. You can, you can blame me. I, can I share it with you? You can go to your workplace, wherever, or at school, and use your hand to share the gospel. But the point is, church, you know, what, what method do you use? Maybe you have uh, scriptures memorized, and maybe you, you have a way of working through those. I think there, there you know, there's some things that we should understand when it comes comes to sharing the gospel, I've, I put up on the screen so there's, I think there's six points that you and I need to include in our gospel presentation, all right? And we need to understand that who God is as creator, you know, who, who he is by his very nature. We understand who, who mankind is. Who are we? We're God's creation, right? And then and thirdly, we need to, to bring sin into the conversation. I know that's a, a popular word. It's an ugly word. Nobody likes to talk about their sin. We like to talk about other people's sin, but we don't like to talk about our own sin. But that needs to be a part of that gospel presentation. Uh, third, uh, fourthly, we need to talk about the cross. That is the central symbol for Christianity that Jesus went to the cross. What did Jesus do on the cross? He died for our sins. And not just die, but he died for our sins. 
And then we need to talk about the resurrection because without the resurrection, like Paul said, our, our faith would be in vain. God has power over death and the grave and, and Jesus rose from the dead. And that's why we know we can place our faith and trust in him. And then, and then finally, we, we bring it to eternal life. Yeah, whatever whatever uh, presentation or, you know, the hand method, whatever, we need to include those things in that. And, and so maybe you already have something you use. I know years ago people used the, the Roman road. You would just take your Bible, go to the book of Romans, and highlight simple verses there in Romans because Paul walks through the gospel there in those first couple of chapters in Romans. And you can just sit down with somebody and just walk them through and just use your pointer finger, sit next to them, and, and just share the gospel with them. That, that is a method. It, okay, you say, "Well, I like something more creative." That's fine. You can come up with your own way. But do we? Do you and I, church, do we have a tool that we're using to share the gospel? Have we internalized it? Do we have it down where at any moment, when when the Spirit leads us to open our mouths to go somewhere, are we ready? Are we prepared to share the gospel? And, and if we're not, Maybe this is, this is the Holy Spirit telling you this morning through Pastor John, let's, let's get ready. What, what do I need to do? What, what can I internalize? What can I memorize in my life so that I will be ready to share the gospel when, when the Holy Spirit leads me to? Um, so... Coming to a close this morning, uh, my, my first question, most important question, is, is for, for someone here, do you know the Lord in a personal way? Have, have, do you have a relationship with God this morning? Now, a relationship is not just knowledge, right? I mean, I, I can say, oh, I know something about President Biden, and I can give you facts about President Biden. But I, I don't have a relationship with President Biden. I don't know him personally, right? So I'm, I'm asking you this morning, do you have a personal relationship with God Almighty through his son Jesus Christ? Ha, has there been a time in your life when you've come and, and you've realized and recognized your own sin and you know what? I'm, there's no way I'm, I'm good enough. The Bible, I know the Bible says that we're all sinners. Has there been a time in your life when you've come to the Lord and just cried out to him and said, God, I need you in my life? If you've not done that, I pray that today might be the day that you would be willing to do that. Um, I just want to ask everybody if you just close your eyes, bow your heads, nobody getting up and moving around, please. If you're here this morning and you want to begin a relationship with Christ, would you call out to him this morning and, and, and say something like this to God in a prayer to, to the Lord? Say, Dear God, I know that you love me. I know that you want a relationship with me. But God, I also know that my sin separates that. Lord, I'm coming to you today. I'm asking you to forgive me of my sins. Thank you for sending your son Jesus to die on the cross to pay for my sins. I believe that Jesus died and rose again. God, help me to place my faith and trust in you. Help me to live for you the best way that I can. In Jesus' name, amen. Uh, in a minute, we're going to have an invitation. Uh, we're going to sing a song. Uh, we're going to have a time where you can come down to the altar and pray. I, I want to challenge you. If, if you prayed that prayer this morning and, and asked Christ to come into your life to be your Lord and Savior, would you come down here and just shake my hand, give me a fist bump, and say, Hey, Pastor John, I, I prayed that prayer. I asked Christ to come into my life. Maybe, maybe you did it a month ago. And maybe you want to, I'm just want to encourage you to, to step forward publicly, share it with the church who loves you, and, and let us as a church help you in your next steps as, as you follow Christ.
Uh, church members, there's a couple of questions for you. Uh, not only church members, but, but those who have already trusted Christ. Where, where are you at this morning? Are you and I listening to the Spirit's voice? His calling in our life? Or are we struggling with that? You know, we think things are going good. Why, why should I do something completely in the opposite direction? Is, is the Spirit pressing on you to do something? I just want to encourage you, uh, be obedient. You know, are, are you being obedient there? Um, and, then, and then secondly, church, we, we all know it's, it's not just the pastor and the staffs and the church leader's job to share the gospel. We all know that. We all have a responsibility to share the gospel. Are, are you and I prepared? Do we know enough? Can, can we share the gospel if we're put into a situation where God's calling us to do that? And so maybe for some of you this morning, maybe it's, it's like, okay, I need to be prepared. Uh, maybe you don't know what to do. Uh, please come down and talk to me or talk to one of our other leaders and, and ask, you know, how, how can I help? I want to learn a method and, and we want to help you if you feel like that's an area that you need to grow in. Uh, I just want to challenge you with that. You know, come, come down. The altar's open. If you want to pray about something, you want to pray what's going on in your life, your family, uh, you're welcome to come down here and pray. If you feel like West Side is the church that, that you need to call home or you need to to move your membership to, I just want to encourage you to come down and you can join our church this morning uh, by filling out a card and, and we will, uh, you know, love on you and, and bring you into our, our community, uh, our faith here at Westside. Uh, whatever the Lord is, is calling you to do, just I pray that you will be obedient to the Spirit. Let's pray. God, this is your time. This is a time where we, uh, Lord, just... We, we pray that, that we will listen intently to what you want us to do this morning. Lord, if, if we need to step out and make a decision publicly, Lord, I pray that we'll do that. If, if we need to, maybe just this morning in the quietness of our pew, if, if we need to, to, to deal with something with you, Lord, I pray that we will do that. That we, we will do what it takes to, to be obedient to you this morning. Lord, uh, thank you for this time. We pray all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. You'll stand. Just as I am without one plea, but that thy blood was shed for me, and that thou bidst me come to thee. as I am and waiting not to rid my soul of one dark blot to thee whose blood can cleanse each spot O Lamb of God I come I come just as I am thou wilt receive wilt welcome pardon cleanse relief because I promise I believe put a pause on this uh, invitation time, Lord. I pray that you'll continue to deal with each of our hearts, Lord. Are, are we being obedient to you? 
Are we, we struggling to, to, to listen to what we already know that you, you have told us to do? Lord, I pray that we'll, we'll continue to just deal with that uh, this afternoon. Uh, Lord, we just come now this time we give our tithes and offerings to you, Lord. We, we thank you for what you're doing in the life of our church. Lord, I just, I'm amazed when I look back over the last three, four years, Lord, of how you have taken care and provided for, for Westside uh, through COVID and everything else, Lord. And uh, Lord, I, I just, I thank you for the faithful members here at Westside who just continually give. Lord, may we give, like Paul challenges us to in Corinthians with a, a cheerful heart, Lord, because we know you're taking it, you're using it, uh, and you're going to use it in ministry to help people hear the gospel. Lord, we love you, and we just pray all these things in Jesus' name. Amen.